I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and we're here in Vancouver, Washington. Currently, we're meeting here at our home uh, in Vancouver. If you're in the Portland, Vancouver area, you could drop by and be part of our congregation on Thursday this evening at 7 o'clock or on Sunday morning at 10 and 11, 15. Sunday morning, we're studying the book of Hebrews. We're in the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews, all about applications in the Christian life. In the book of Ephesians this evening, we're in chapter 4, dealing with the royal family escutcheon. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into it. And then on Wednesday, my wife, Judy, right here, has a class for the ladies. And I understood that they were finished, but apparently they're still wrapping up the study of Elijah. There's always more to say about some of these Old Testament prophets. Uh, Judy's getting to be kind of like me. You uh, get a subject and you just don't want to let go of it. So uh, they're finishing that up and then they'll have a different study and we'll let you know. So that's on Wednesday right here in our house at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You can join her at that time if you so choose. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Remember, at Grace and Truth Bible Church, we teach the whole Bible, every verse in the Bible, every time, all the time. If you are desirous of uh, in-depth Bible teaching from the original language, verse by verse, that's exactly what we do here to edify the believers so that we might build up the body of Christ. In fact, that's what we're going to be talking about this evening as we get into chapter 4, uh, verse 4, and continuing from that point. It is our custom at the beginning of each of our Bible studies to take time for silent prayer. We believe this is necessary moment by moment throughout the day and the weeks and years as a believer so that we can make sure that we have the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit, particularly when we have Bible study so that we can understand the mind of Christ, which is the Word of God. 1 John 1, 9 clearly says if we that is believers, John includes himself there, if we confess our sins, that is if we acknowledge them, name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe that picks up the ones we forgot about or didn't know that we had committed, and we have the enabling or the filling of the Holy Spirit as is commanded in the scripture by the great apostle Paul. So with that in mind and in preparation for our study this evening, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for another opportunity to look into your word, to be edified of soul so that we can live that kind of life that would be pleasing to you. We recognize the so great salvation that you provided for us through the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ, in his substitutionary atoning death on the cross of Calvary. We recognize that he is now with you, seated at your right hand, and soon to come to take us to where he is in that heavenly home. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to fellowship one with the other and to study your word. Pray now as we are in the word and being edified of soul that you would challenge and motivate us by the things we study. We pray it all in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word this evening to the epistle by Paul to the church in Ephesus, the epistle known as Ephesians. Uh, Open your Bible then to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. As we noted in previous classes, we are looking at what we call the escutcheon of the royal family. That is to say, the family crest or the coat of arms. You might remember back in the days of chivalry, each family, the parent family of certain groups and tribes throughout Europe, uh, had a coat of arms or an escutcheon. It was their family crest, if you will. Well, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're members of a 
royal family. So if you don't have an escutcheon from Europe or somewhere else that is uh, based on uh, the family tree going back, you now have one as a member of the royal family. And we know that we're royal family because Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 4, that we are royal family. And royalty means that we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ, who will become King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we share this escutcheon, this coat of arms, this family crest, if you will, and it's here in these verses from verse 4 through verse 6. There are seven features of the escutcheon, and we have noted them in the past. And so we have uh, uh, on the table here, for those who are with us, we have some copies of this. And this is what we have uh, designed. Actually, uh, this was designed by Dr. Glenn Carnegie years ago in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it was emblazoned on his podium for many, many years. And of course, uh, since that time, I have reconstructed it, not using the Greek words, since no one uh, other than uh, the pastors knows the Greek. Uh, I put them into the English. So you can have a copy of the royal family coat of arms or the royal family escutcheon. We have them here on the table, but you can also go to the website under the charts and graphs, and you can find it there, your own copy of this one. And this can be yours because each one of us is part of the royal family of the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore we share these features. Now there are here seven features that are part of the escutcheon, and they are all mentioned right here. And so we noted the first verses in chapter 4. It says here that uh, we are called... Uh, with a special invitation or calling from the Lord. And we're to live with humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance uh, for one another, and to do it in love. And verse 3 says, being diligent to uh, preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace are the indication of the escutcheon which is to follow in verse 4. Later in the text, we'll have the unity of faith, that is the word of God or doctrine. So we have two things that are very important to the Christian, the filling of the spirit. That's what we have here, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, the Holy Spirit who indwells and enables or fills us, and the unity of doctrine, that is the faith that we'll see in this same chapter. These two are the most important features in the Christian life. We are indwelt and enabled by the Holy Spirit, and our task is to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth can also be described as the faith. The faith, as Jude said, that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. That is the doctrines of scripture that pertain to Jesus Christ as far as we understand in this dispensation, and for that matter, principles throughout the entirety of the word of God. Last time we looked at the first few of these, and uh, in the outline, we simply are looking at uh, one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, uh, and we got down to one Lord. So we had gotten that far already. We note there are seven features, one body, one uh, church, uh, one, uh, <laughs> I put in there the body, so one body, one hope of the church is the body of Christ, one body, one hope of the calling, and then, of course, uh, one Lord, uh, one faith, and uh, looking here, starting with this, okay, <laughs> I, I had them listed incorrectly here. At any rate, one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling. And then we move to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. So we'll take some time to finish that up. We did the one body in the previous class, and we noted the body metaphor is used to indicate the believers in Jesus Christ in this historic period known as the church age. So the body is a metaphor for the church. The church is the collective members, all believers in Jesus Christ from the day of Pentecost until the rapture of the church. Soon to be when the Lord returns for us, the bride. So we have the body of Christ, we have the church, the bride of Christ. Paul also speaks about the fact that we are being built up 
uh, in Christ. And therefore, as Peter says, we have a building. We are, in fact, in the building, individual stones that are holy stones entered into the building, uh, which is the church. And the building individually is made up of small tabernacles into a large and holy tabernacle. We noted all of these and looked at a number of passages last time depicting various aspects. So this first word then, one body, indicates that we're all members of the dispensation of the church. One spirit, we noted there and looked at a number of passages. This refers to the Holy Spirit who indwells every member of the church age from Pentecost to the rapture of the church. We have something that no other dispensation in the past had. Uh, the Old Testament, they had something called endowment with power, and they could have been temporarily indwelt. But David uh, said uh, he was indwelt from time to time for specific ministry. But he also said in one of his prayers, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's not a prayer that we can pray. Whereas in the Old Testament, David and of course even Saul at one time or other had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but it could be removed through disobedience. That's not true today. The indwelling is permanent throughout the dispensation of the church. The enabling or filling is what is temporary based on whether or not we are sinning or not sinning. If we're not sinning, we continue to have the filling or enabling of the Holy Spirit. If we commit a personal sin, whether it's mental, verbal, or overt, we break that fellowship. We do not lose the indwelling, but we lose the enabling. It's kind of like the power that comes into your house, and obviously it's all there unless you hit the breaker box, but uh, that breaks up our illustration. So you have power in the house, but if you don't turn on the light or any appliance, that power is not usable until you throw the switch. The way you do that, of course, is to confess any personal sins, and then you have the enabling of God the Holy Spirit. It says, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. We noted specifically here, this has to do with our Christian vocation. He's going to spell this out a little bit later in this text with regard to spiritual gifts. Paul, in this particular chapter, is going to address spiritual gifts of communication. Elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, he enumerates other spiritual gifts one each at least to each member of the royal family who receives a spiritual gift for the function within the body of Christ. We'll take a look at some of those as we come to them. And so that's kind of where we left off last time. And uh, we spent some time there as well. And then we continued on and said, the next one, number four, is one Lord. Now we know that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one Lord Jesus Christ. He is the unique person of all eternity. He is God, but he's more than God in that he is also uh, humanity. He is undiminished deity, true humanity, and he took upon himself the sins of the world. So not only is he God, undiminished deity, true humanity through the virgin birth, but he also became the savior of all members of the human race. And so we have one Lord. Uh, I think we looked at a couple of passages. There are many places when Jesus Christ is referred to as Lord, not the least of which is in Acts 16, 31, where it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There we have three titles for Jesus Christ. Obviously, his personal name is Jesus, which, of course, is uh, comes from the Hebrew word Yasha, or the long form Yahushua, which means savior or deliverer. And so he was, his name Jesus, but he was also called Lord. That refers to his deity. Christ refers to his work that he was sent to accomplish. And that includes everything as part of the salvific passage, his death on the cross and subsequent burial and resurrection. All of that described by Christos, which comes from a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach the one sent with the work that he was to perform. So we have this word Lord, which clearly indicates the second member of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know in context that this is referring to Jesus Christ because at the end of the verse, it speaks of one God and Father. So the Lord here is the second member of the Trinity, whereas when we get to verse six, one God and Father of all refers to the first member of the Trinity. We've already seen as we began this back in verse 4 that we have one spirit. 
So in this escutcheon, we actually have all three members of the Trinity. We have one spirit, we have one Lord, Jesus Christ, and we have one God and Father of us all. The entire Trinity is part of the escutcheon that we just mentioned earlier. And so we have one Lord. I think that's where we left off last time, if you were with us. And that moves us down to one faith. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> if you'll turn to Ephesians 4, 5, you'll see the second one there which actually is number five in the list of these seven features of the royal family escutcheon. The one faith. We have Mia here, which is the, uh, the uh, number one. And, of course, uh, this refers to a specific faith, one faith. Now, we might say, well, uh, there are many faiths or faith that unbelievers have, simply believing that, uh, for example, that an airplane will stay aloft because of airfoil and lift. Uh, we have many things that we believe in which become part of faith. The faith, or when it's used with the article, or here uh, when we have the uh, word mia or one, indicates singularity. So this is not just any old faith. This is the one faith, and this describes the faith that includes both salvific faith, believing in Jesus Christ, and the day-by-day -day faith, believing in the things of God, the Word of God. So the faith is everything that is involved in the teaching of the Word of God. We might substitute the word here, doctrine, one doctrine. That is, for believers in Jesus Christ, we have unification of the faith. In fact, he's going to state that a little bit later on in the passage when he speaks about uh, the unity of the faith. He's going to replicate that one more time. So this one faith then has to do with both phase one, that is the faith to believe in Jesus Christ, as well as phase two, our moment by moment belief in the principles in the Word of God and everything that pertains to God in our Bible. So we have all of these. Uh, and for example, we see in Acts 16.31, belief there, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now the word believe is a verb, but the word faith is a noun. Now they are really related because faith and belief come from the same root. Believe is piscuo, the verb. Faith is pistas. They have the same root uh, and therefore the verb we translate as belief, but we can also translate it as faith or the faith. And then to believe, that's also the word faith. But we don't use it as a verb. We don't say, I faith it. We say, I believe it. And what do you believe? You believe the word of God, which is the faith, all the principles of the word of God. So we see it there. We see it over in Ephesians earlier in chapter 2, if you remember, going back to chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And there we see the definite article, the faith, the faith, and that not of yourselves, that is the salvation is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. The salvation itself is the gift of God. The mechanism for appropriating that salvation is the faith. In this case, it is the faith believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we noted in Acts 16, 31. This we would call phase one, entrance into the plan of God by belief and accepting by faith the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we have phase two, which would be found in places like Acts chapter 6, we can turn over there just for a moment. There are many passages, but we're just going to look at a couple here in Acts 6 and chapter 7. In Acts 6 and chapter, chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, And the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and as many as of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. That is to say, the faith here indicates the Christian way of life, not just the gospel. They were already saved because it says that the word kept spreading and they were continuing in their growth. Basically, the number of disciples, the fact that they were disciples indicates that they were already saved and they were becoming obedient in the faith that is the doctrine of the word of God. This is faith in phase two. And then we have uh, 1 Timothy 3, 
way over towards the end in the pastoral epistles in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 9. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 9. Here it says, deacons, that is, ministers within the local church, to include the pastor and those administrative assistants to the pastor, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not too double-tongued or addicted to much wine, nor fond of sordid gain, but holding, here it is in verse 9, to the mystery of the faith. The mystery of the faith pertains particularly to the doctrine of the dispensation of the church. Here the word faith applies to all the teaching of the dispensation of the church. Paul called this a mystery, and he spoke about that, as we noted, in Ephesians chapter 3, in a number of places there, as well as elsewhere. These are the doctrines that are pertinent in this dispensation. And so deacons, whether they are the pastor or the assistant administrators to the pastors, are to understand and hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And so we see it here as well. And then in verse chapter 4, Four and verse 1, down a little bit further. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later time, some will fall away from the faith. That is to say, these might even be believers who have moved away from the intake of the Word of God. Yes, it happens to believers. There are people who are born again, who are going to be in the kingdom forever. They'll be taken up in the rapture, but they will be minus rewards and decorations at the judgment seat of Christ. We have spoken of that in previous classes. We're not going to go to that at this particular point, but we understand that there are rewards for faithful service in taking in and adhering to the faith, the word of God. These people, of course, have failed to do so, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Doesn't mean that believers can be demon-possessed, not at all, but they can be demon-influenced. This is something that's hard for many believers to understand, and it's almost impossible, sadly, for many pastors to even teach this. Uh, either they think that believers can be demon-possessed, which is wrong, or that believers cannot be influenced by demons, which is likewise wrong. You can't be possessed by a demon because you have the Holy Spirit indwelling and possessing you. But you can be influenced and deceived. And sadly, many people, especially in our day, although this has been true all through the history of the church, all through the history of the Word of God from the very beginning, men are deceived in multiple ways. Several weeks ago, we spent a lot of time looking at deception and deception see things that cause us to fall away from the teaching, from the faith. And of course, obviously, this can happen to believers who fall away. Uh, they will lose reward. Of course, they come under discipline for the remainder of their life if they do not confess that deception and deceit. At any rate here, it has to do with the fact that they are uh, falling away from the faith, the teaching of the Word of God. And one last one over in Jude, one of my favorites, towards the end, right before the book of Revelation, in Jude, and there's only one chapter there, so it's Jude, verse 3. And it's interesting, we taught the book of Jude, and Jude, of course, uh, one of the half-brothers, Jude and James. James probably wrote the first epistle in the New Testament. It's likely that Jude wrote the last epistle other than John who wrote the capstone, the revelation that he gave. And of course that was the last uh, book. But uh, right before that we have uh, Jude writing his epistle and in verse 3 he makes an interesting statement speaking to believers. He says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. Now, obviously, our common salvation here is referring to phase one, how we get saved. He wanted to give a treatise on the gospel and basically how one comes to faith in Christ and all the things that come uh, and are part of the blessings that accrue to us at the very moment of salvation. Now, salvation continues moment by moment in the deliverance of the Christian life, but Jude was going to explain uh, more about the momentary uh, act of 
being born again, that salvation we call phase one, the instant where you believe in Jesus Christ and all of these blessings accrue to you, some 60 blessings, uh, some of them, many of them for time, but some of them for eternity. However, it says, uh, after making every effort to write about our common salvation, he says, I was impressed and felt necessary to write to you appealing that you contend for the faith, the faith. Here, the definite article is not just believing in Christ. It is the substance of faith. Faith can be the act of believing, or it can be the substance that is believed. Here, it refers to the substance of belief. And the New American Standard has correctly translated it as the faith. The faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. And then he goes on to speak about certain people who've crept in unnoticed, those who were long before marked out uh, for condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of God into licentiousness and deny the only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And he continues on in that vein. So basically, instead of a treatise on salvation, uh, he has a treatise on the difficulty within the church age in that very first century, as he writes, about deception and deceit that has crept into local churches. They had the gospel correct, at least initially, although Paul says later on, even the simple gospel got distorted uh, and deception crept in. But the teaching of the word of God, as you go through the annals of church history, we see how many heresies have crept in. The so-called church fathers debated so many things, and in some cases they got it right. More often than not, uh, many of them got it wrong. I spent a great deal of time studying the church fathers, and although some people are incredibly impressed with the church fathers, I see that there was something really lacking in most of their discernment. As an example, Martin Luther, uh, who of course uh, did a noble effort breaking with the Catholic Church and all of the ritual and routine and works that were part of that. Nevertheless, he still had a hatred for the Jews and was anti-Semitic. As a matter of fact, Adolf Hitler and those who hate the Jews always appeal as if they were Christians back to Martin Luther. So that's just one example of the great church fathers, so-called, and their errors which have been prevalent even to this very day. So while the church fathers gave information, we have to go right back to the word of God and not those who interpreted it in that first or second or even third century. We must go back to the original text and delineate the faith and that was once and for all delivered to the saints, not the faith as it was uh, upgraded and altered by the church fathers. Well, that's all I'm going to say about that. All right, so that gives us then these passages, the faith, two things, the faith to believe in Jesus Christ and the faith, which is the substance that is believed. In our local church, we have a statement of faith. It indicates all those things, or at least a summary of the facts that we believe in terms of the Word of God, the deity of Christ. We have an understanding of God proper, God, theology. We have an understanding of basic understanding of prophecy. All of these things are delineated uh, in our at our website with regard to what we believe. We call them the articles of faith. We might say they're articles of the faith and what we believe with regard to God, Jesus Christ, and the Bible. All right, that moves us then to the next word, which is one, baptism. One, baptism. By the way, these words, uh, ace me a hen, uh, I learned that in first year Greek from Dr. Carnegie. We have ace me a hen, uh, and uh, uh, hen has to do with the neuter one, Mia has to do with the fem, and uh, haste has to do with the masculine. And all of these are used. We have haste, kurios, because it's masculine. We have mia, pistos, because it's a feminine noun. And hen, baptisma, because it is neuter. And in first year Greek, we learn haste, mia, hen. They are three forms, masculine, feminine, and neuter, of the cardinal number uno, one. And so instead of just writing one, depending on whether it was a masculine, feminine, or neuter noun, we have a different word, ace, 
for masculine, Mia for feminine, and Hen for the neuter. But all of them are the cardinal number one. And just like the definite article, they particularize that particular word. And so as we have one Lord, one faith, we now have one baptism. Well, this brings up an interesting thought. How many baptisms are there in Scripture? As it turns out, there are seven baptisms that we can find in Scripture. Well, when it says there's one baptism, does that mean that the Scriptures are wrong when it speaks of other baptisms? No, it means that there is one baptism with regard to the dispensation of the church. That one baptism enters us into union with Jesus Christ. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with spiritual gifts per se, per se even though spiritual gifts emanate from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It does not have to do directly with the spiritual gifts, uh, but uh, rather has to do with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so we have here the baptism, which basically enters us into union with Christ. It's a positional identification. We're going to look at a couple of passages that clearly teach that. By the way, I was listening to a Bible teacher on the web uh, today on Facebook. Usually they're off the off their rockers or wacky, but this guy was right on the money. And he said, do you know there's a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So I stopped and listened. Sure enough, he said, the indwelling is permanent for every believer in the dispensation of the church. I went, hallelujah. Truth being taught on Facebook. Who knew? And then he says, but the filling or enabling of the Holy Spirit is contingent upon whether or not we're in fellowship. And we can lose the filling, but we never lose the indwelling. I about dropped my cell phone right on the spot to hear somebody actually teaching truth on Facebook. But there it is. Well, after all, uh, we're on Facebook too, so I guess it's all. <laughs> one <coughs> one bab, <coughs> pardon me. When I get wound up, I lose my voice. So one baptism has to do with the not the indwelling per se, but the entrance into union with Christ. It enters us into union with Christ, subsequently indwelling us, subsequently enabling or filling us. So there are about six ministries of the Holy Spirit, and this has to do with this baptism, which is the entrance into union with Christ. As a matter of fact, if you hold the place, <clears throat> and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now this section deals with the spiritual gifts in chapter 12. So you might note that in your Bible, the list of spiritual gifts other than the teaching gifts that we note here in Ephesians chapter 4. But here we have many other gifts in the list of spiritual gifts. But it also says that it's all based on the Holy Spirit. So when we get down to verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, we were all baptized. That means entered into positional union, uh, into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free. We were all made to drink, as it were, metaphorically, of one Spirit. At the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you are entered into union with Christ, and you are said to be baptized into Christ. Has nothing to do with water, uh, has nothing to do with uh, anything physical at all. It is a spiritual baptism. And so that's the one that is here. Well, what about all the other ones? Well, we'll get to those in a moment. So we have this one. You can also go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Here it says again, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Here in chapter 6, he talks about our entrance into Christ's death. How could I be baptized into his death? Well, people say, well, that's when you go under the water. That's not what's intended here. Water baptism is symbolic of what happens spiritually when you believe in Christ. Spiritually, you are entered into union with Christ, seated at the right hand of the water, at the, at the right hand of the Father. No water, no water. Baptism here, the word baptizo or baptismas 
or all of the cognates that we translate as baptize or baptism, all have to do with identification. In ancient times, they would baptize a piece of cloth by taking a white piece of cloth and dipping it into, let's say, a vat of purple dye. The dye would, of course, color the white cloth and make it purple, used for royalty. The color uh, then identified that cloth with royalty, no longer with white. So it was a re-identification. There was an immersion into that dye. And so it comes to be identification, and the key meaning is to be identified. Sometimes it has to be uh, something like dip, dipped in water, water baptism, or uh, dipped in some type of dye to color fabric. But many times it simply has to do with identification. Some baptisms have nothing whatever to do with water. For example, judgment is said to be a baptism of fire. <laughs> No water there. Thank you very much. They wish there was water. The baptism of fire will be the sentence for the unbelievers. Right now they're incarcerated in a terrible place called torments, but eventually torments and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever, and there'll be no water there at all. The baptism of fire. In a sense, uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon uh, the di disciples, they were baptized uh, again with fire, but it was the fire of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, and it was judgment against those who rejected Jesus Christ. More about that in the study of the baptism. If you'd like a fuller study of this, you can go to our website, Grace and Truth Bible Church, and there we have the study, the doctrine of the baptisms plural. I'll run through them very quickly for you. Uh, we're not going to spend a great deal of time. Obviously, going back to the earliest one that we have uh, in the Bible is the baptism of Moses. Now, the, this doesn't refer to Moses when he was a baby placed into the wicker basket and floated down the Nile uh, to the princess uh, in Pharaoh's court. Uh, that, of course, and even then, he didn't get wet. He was in a basket that was covered with pitch, and he certainly didn't get wet. But that's not the baptism of Moses. The baptism of Moses is spoken of in 1 Corinthians 10, too. Might turn over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 2. And here it speaks about verse 1. For I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud... That's the Shekinah glory of God. And all passed through the sea. They passed through the Red Sea. But um, I heard my wife teaching on this just the other day. And she was saying multiple times in Exodus, it says, and they crossed on dry ground. I've seen a couple of movies where they were slopping along, stepping in puddles as they went through the Red Sea. They did not. They were kicking up dust. It was dry land. You can check it out in the book of Exodus as they passed through the Red Sea, dry ground. And so it says they were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they were in the sea, but none of them got wet. No water, because the water was piled up on each side as they walked through. Only people who got baptized was a baptism of judgment would have been Pharaoh and his armies when the waters came crashing down. And those chariot wheels and chariots and remnants of horses and riders are still to be found in the Red Sea. In fact, there is some archaeology that claims they have actually found chariot wheels and the remains of horses and men in some places uh, in the area of the Red Sea. But that's a story for another time. So my point is, this is a dry baptism. The baptism of Moses had no water in the sense that Moses did not get wet. And then we have <clears throat> John the Baptist, who had a baptism of repentance. Now his baptism, of course, was wet because they were putting them under the water those who had repented of their sin were baptized because they repented of their sins. His was a baptism, identification with the fact that they had sinned, and when they came out of the water, their sins basically were remitted because they confessed their sins, were water baptized, and when they came out, the sins were forgiven. That was the baptism of John the Baptist, baptism of repentance. By the way, you can check that out in Matthew 3.11.
So we have that, which is a wet baptism. And then we have the third one, which is basically the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, when John baptized him, he baptized him with water in the Jordan. That's a wet baptism. That was an identification with the fact that Jesus was now entering into his ministry. It was a wet baptism. That's not the one we have in our passage, but that was identifying Jesus Christ. That's found in Matthew 3, 13 to 17. And then we have the baptism of the cup. The baptism of the cup. We speak of the cup that we take during the communion service. And Jesus spoke to the disciples and said, Can you drink of the cup that I have to drink of? Speaking of the cross, can you be baptized with the baptism that I must be baptized with? He was speaking of the baptism of the cup. Both the word baptism in that case and cup refer to his death on the cross. No water. He said, I thirst. There was no water at all. They gave him some sour mash vinegar and he refused it. And so no water for Jesus. It was a dry baptism. He bore the sins of the world on the cross and that was his baptism. He was identified with sin on the cross. Never being a sinner, having no personal sin, no old sin nature, but sin was placed on his body and in his human soul by God the Father and he took it all. He drank the cup of the sins of the world. He bore them on the cross. He was identified or baptized in the cup of the cross. And so we have this baptism of the cup that's found in two places, Luke 12, 50 and Matthew 20, 22. We've spoken of it in connection with the communion service. Number five is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the one we have in our passage. That's in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It is a dry baptism. And then, of course, we have <coughs> the believer's water baptism. That is a separate baptism. Water baptism for believers occurs after we've made a decision to believe in Jesus Christ. Remember that when Paul uh, was released from jail and in Acts 16, they went down and the whole family, the jailer and his family, uh, went down to be baptized, he and his whole family, because they had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and were saved. And then they were water baptized. It's a simple identification with the reality that you've believed in Jesus Christ. Water baptism, then, is a public testimony of what you have believed personally in your soul. It is the baptism of believers. It's a ritual baptism of water. And then, of course, one last one, number seven, the baptism of fire. We've already noted in Matthew 3, 11, and Luke 3, 16 and 17, the baptism of fire, speaking of judgment with regard to the fact that the disciples were baptized because the Old Testament prophecy was that Israel was going to be judged for rejecting Messiah. And so Pentecost and the baptism that came upon the uh, disciples indicated the judgment had fallen on those who would reject Jesus Christ. Well, there are seven baptisms, three wet ones, the baptism of Jesus Christ by John, the baptism of repentance by John. We have water baptism ritual for believers. And then we have four dry, the baptism of Moses. No one got wet. We have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the one spoken of in our passage, no water. We have the baptism of the cup, Jesus Christ's death on the cross, and the baptism of fire. Uh, that, of course, refers to judgment, and the baptism of fire will occur at the second advent when all unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire. So we have one baptism, and that's what we find right here. How's our time? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, a couple more here for the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's look to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 5. Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. He was speaking about the fact that in the upper room, after Jesus had been crucified, they were kind of hiding out for fear of the authorities coming and taking them to be crucified likewise. 
And of course, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and it was the Holy Spirit who baptized them. And this is in Acts 1, 5. And then over in chapter 11, uh, 11, 16, Acts 11 and verse 16, it says this, And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, so God uh, therefore gave them over, uh, gave them the same gift that he gave uh, to us also, when after, notice, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should stand in their way and therefore after believing they were baptized in the Holy Spirit in the book of Galatians two more Galatians chapter 3 27 Galatians 3 and 27 here it talks about the baptism into Christ look at verse 27 it says for all who uh, all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ, baptized into Christ, not water. This is the spiritual identification, entrance into union with Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek, neither slave or free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, and you do, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. That brings up a subject for another <coughs> time. Finally, then, in John chapter 1, John chapter 1 and 23, John chapter 1, is this first John 120, that doesn't look right. I mean, that must be First John. Is that First John? I must have misrobed. Nope. Well, there's another verse that I wanted to look at there. Basically, it says that uh, you did not have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was with you, but he will be in you. And that's the verse I wanted. I've mis- uh, printed it here in my notes. We'll come back and pick that up next time. Remind me. Father God, thank you again for the opportunity to study these principles related to one baptism. That is the entrance into union with Jesus Christ. Number six on the hit parade of features that are part of the royal family escutcheon. That is the fact that we have a uh, an emblazonment of our family heritage for the royal family. And therefore, each of these features is something that we possess by virtue of being in Jesus Christ. And for that one person who's here this evening, without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know God had you personally in mind when Jesus Christ was sent from the Godhead into human history through the virgin birth to become a sinless human being, a sinless sacrifice. And therefore, he could be qualified by the Father to go to the cross and bear our sins. And right now, right where you sit, you can have everlasting life simply by believing in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely called and chosen son, his only born, humanly speaking, son, that whosoever, anybody, that's you, put your name in there, who believes in him, believes what? Believes he is undiminished deity, that is God, true humanity, perfect humanity, sinless humanity, and at the same time, the unique savior of all mankind. In fact, Jesus Christ is a unique celebrity of all the universe, and he bore your sins and mine on the cross of Calvary. Right now, right where you sit, you can have everlasting life. You will not be exposed to the wrath of God, but have instead everlasting life, forgiveness of sins, and about 60 blessings in time and potential rewards in eternity. Won't you do it before you leave? There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John said that his witness is that God has given us this everlasting life. And this life is in his son. He that has the son has this life. He that does not have the son does not have this life. 
And he says, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father God, thank you again for this opportunity to study these things. Encourage us by our position in your Son, Jesus Christ, and challenge us to look forward with great expectation and anticipation to his return for us very, very soon. We thank you for these things, and we pray it in his matchless and powerful name. Amen and amen.